Um, thank you guys for joining my talk. Um, today we're going to have a, 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 a quick uh, look into the uh, attack surface of Kubernetes, Kubernetes environments, um, primarily from the attacker's perspective. Uh, what that means, I will come later to that. Just in the beginning, a few words uh, to, concerning us. Uh, we are Condignum. Uh, we are a security company based in Vienna and also in, in, in Germany. Um, I mean, I'm in Berlin, one of my colleagues in, 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 in the Ruhr area. Um, and we are, yeah, we are, we are growing right now. Uh, what we're doing, we're having a pretty wide portfolio of security uh, services. We're also having a security platform for all questions regarding computer security, security requirements, hardening, a security, uh, like management of security services, like pen tests and everything. Um, we're doing classical security consulting and offering various managed security services. Um, if you're looking for a job, you know, just give us a ping. There's, there will be a chance you're working in my team. I'm, I'm doing the team lead of the penetration testing team. Um, we're going to be talking about um, today. Um, first of all, let's give you a quick intro uh, into what Kubernetes actually is, what, 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 is, what, what, what we're trying to achieve and what, what its main goals are. Uh, all, the, all the components, um, and also a few words uh, regarding containers, because containers is one of the you know main aspects of Kubernetes environments. Uh, and then let's switch uh, quick towards uh, Kubernetes and its security, the attack surface, uh, the, the robust access uh, control model, uh, pod security policies, um, network security policies, and some main takeaways in the end. And in the end, I mean, I added, I think, about 20 to 30 slides um, regarding possible misconfiguration of cluster components. And just if you, I think there's something in there for, for pen testers, for administrators, everybody who wants or has to deal uh, with Kubernetes clusters. OK, let's jump right into it. There we go. So what's Kubernetes? Um, it's, let's put it like this, it's deployment, management, and scaling of containerized applications. That's not my wording, that's the wording of the Kubernetes Foundation, um, but it really like sums it up. You know, um, It's about if you wanna, let's say you have a, an application, it doesn't matter if it's uh, developed by, by you or if it's just open source software or board, um, you wanna deploy it, uh, manage the life cycle, scale it if there's more requests and everything, and Kubernetes is a tool which helps you in doing that. Yeah, it also gives you a little glimpse uh, if you just, you know, at, at, at which point you need or want to have Kubernetes. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to answer if you have a, you know, a, a bigger number of containers and various applications and have to manage load and everything. And you're, you're already using containers for your stuff. Um, and you want to do like more automation, then you can maybe think about having a look at Kubernetes um, but still, you can still like play like play around with with it. There are nice tools available these days um, for to set, set up a really easy on-premise uh, cluster in twenty minutes. Yeah. Um, so what are containers? I mean, this won't be a, mainly a container talk, but you know some basics um, should be more or less understood. It is an isolation approach. It's not only an isolation approach. Um, but it is one, um, and it has existed since decades in the Unix world uh, in different approaches. I mean, there used to be jails on Unix and everything, and these days on Linux. What it is, is it to more or less try to, to isolate a container from others, from other applications? Uh, it's namespaces, uh, the process ID namespace, networking, mounts, inter-process communication for, for separating these. Um, then there's control groups for managing computing resources. Then you can uh, drop uh, Linux kernel capabilities and you can change root into a separate copy and write file system. That's really, really, really vaguely what a container is. And then the application is running more or less by itself. It's not, but you know, it looks like. Um, yeah, then it's running more or less isolated from other process on the same system. I dropped some links down there. If you more, if you're more interested into containers by itself, um, check them out. They're, they're more available. Uh, yeah, Manuel, the slides will be available in the, in the end. If you guys feel like, I will, I will probably drop them. So there's no need to, to write or something. So let's go on. Uh, this is a quick overview 
about uh, the, the architecture of Kubernetes. Um, I'm not going to describe every single uh, aspect of it, just like the, the most important ones. Probably the most important was the Kube AP server in the middle on the Kubernetes master. Um, that is um, a REST-based, they call it control plane um, of the entire thing. Um, REST-based API um, for, for taking in um, requests. Um, and it's more or less controls every behavior of the, of the cluster. Then there's an, an ETCD, which is a key value store database, high performance. Um, that's available. There's a scheduler, which is looking for, for places to deploy your, your containers. And on the right, you see uh, multiple Q Kubernetes nodes. They, uh, they can you know, scale up, um, up until quite a good number. And on there, there are two really important aspects running. Um, one is the kubelet. The kubelet is talking with the kube AP server and is taking in requests. For example, deploy some new containers, or what's the state of my containers, and so on. And there's also the kube proxy, which which job is it to represent the network services you want to expose in your in your your containers? I call it containers right now. In the next slide, we're going to find a different wording which which Kubernetes is using. Um, on these nodes, there's also the container runtime, um, which we're going to see in the next slide. First of all, a bit of just a few words uh, in the naming concepts of Kubernetes. Um, the most important one ones for you right now is, is pods. A pod, yeah. This is at least one container running in the same, in the, sharing the same PID, net, and IPC namespace, and the same C, uh, C group. Yeah. Uh, Kubernetes namespace, uh, uh, we, you could describe it as virtual clusters. It's not our Linux namespaces, it's something different. It's their own methodology, you know? Um, yeah. And you know when when a pod is uh, when when containers are running in a namespace, they, they they're sharing the same resources and they're running in the same security context. Let's say there are other things like replica sets, deployments, stateful sets, and daemon sets, which are more or less for, um, responsible for keeping your application running. You know, or just like redeploying it, scaling it on on the different nodes, and so on. Um, that's more important for for ad administrators who really have to deploy the applications. Um, what's also important is um, everybody who, who like uh, has, uh, you know, deployed a, for example, a Docker container, um, usually isn't it doing it by itself. You can do it by itself. Um, you can run a container on your, on your shell with a few uh, command line tools um, to set up, you know, namespaces and C groups and chain shooting in the file system. But usually you're taking a container runtime like Docker, or in this case, it's cryo. Um, just um, the most important aspect is after after Kubelet has received a job to start a new pod, it is not doing it by itself. Um, it's talking via an, an interface, uh, a more or less well-defined interface, um, with a, with a container runtime. And after that, you know the container runtime is pulling the image and you know, putting it on a file system, setting up all namespaces and, and so on. In the end, if, if everything is uh, like working, working out fine, there's your pod, your container running on the same machine. Let's just have a look at the chat. Okay. Yeah, so this, there's, there's a runtime, it's running on every container node and taking in the job and really like taking all the, all the, the hard work of managing the containers. Okay. Um, in the beginning, because we want, don't want to like dig too much into that, but it's there, it has to be kept in mind. There are other pretty good talks about that. Um, the attack surface of containers and their runtime by itself. As saying before, we don't talk about it here further, but there are, there are well-known vulnerabilities and every few months something is popping up, you know, container runtime escapes and everything. There's a good number of CVEs. Um, just like you can try having a look at them or if you're running them just Patchy runtime all the time when you when you see there's like like a patch coming up. Um, they are overprivileged containers. They you know when they're having too much capabilities uh, interacting with the kernel or uh, to file mounts you know are too too heavily used. You can access the underlying file system of the of the worker itself. Things like access to, to, to the Docker socket or just you know in general kernel vulnerabilities um, being in a in a container or in a pod by Kubernetes doesn't um, necessarily um, 
not expose you towards kernel wolves, typical uh, local privilege escalation vulnerabilities on Linux. Uh, not always, but quite often kernel bugs. Um, and by itself, you know, when you're not using any different security mechanism mechanisms, your containers are probably prone to be vulnerable to what's towards classical kernel bugs. So that has to be kept in mind that this, this doesn't go away by itself. That's changing a bit these days because um, SecComp, as you might, might have heard of, it's a kernel security feature, which lets you reduce uh, which possible uh, kernel syscalls, just for this uh, tool for interacting with the kernel, um, can be limited. And therefore, maybe just like reduced the attack surface of the kernel seen from the container view. Um, and there's a I think there's an, an alpha feature right now in Kubernetes, which is taking this uh, the second runtime default. Um, I think Docker is using it already um, and using it by default. So you have some profile for second running on all your pods. Um, yeah, still off, still alpha. I think you have to like opt in to use it, but it it is coming slowly. Um, just in general, if you want to have a good overview about container security. There's a link down there with really small and hands-on uh, advices. Okay, so now we come to the the, the main. Just, okay, there we go. We come to, to the main topic of the of the talk, which is the attack services of Kubernetes by itself. So let's just imagine uh, a thing that you know you are running your your application and it's using. Uh, Spring core, yeah, you might have heard last week, something happened, you know, on, on Twitter, somebody dropped a screenshot um, often in, with, you know, in, in Chinese and then on there was an exploit for spring core. And it was actually a weird thing. Not so many people were infected in the, uh, sorry, affected in the end, but still, you know, this is, it was a zero day, it was available, there was no fix, um, easily, uh, you know, mass exploitable. By, by, by itself. So let's just imagine we had, you know, our our reverse shell, our code execution on on a Java core application, and now we are on this container. So I mean, what's what's new? What's what's different from from a classical virtual machine or a native Linux machine or or whatsoever? You know, that's that's a question when you when you have to look at at a, the difference from from a container managed by Kubernetes versus a classical system. Um, to make it short, most stuff more or less stays the same because the attacker, what, 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 what do he wants to steal the data or moving laterally, laterally throughout the network. So seeing data means usually files that are accessible right now or via an NFS share or via an SQL database or moving literally means, okay, like where's the next service which I can like, you know, attack or can I do a port scan? Um, where's, how can I get a foothold into uh, the Windows uh, uh, domain, for example? Yeah. These are the questions which you're usually facing when you have um, compromised um, a Linux system. Um, yeah, what's different uh, in, in the first glance is persistence is different because containers, pods are quite often a pretty, pretty short and living. Not always, they can run it for a longer time, but here and there, they're going to redeploy it, and what's then? You then your your shell is gone. Um, but that, that means you know here and there you have to like re-exploit the vulnerability. Um, but you can also to, like try to achieve persistence um, in the com in the community in, uh, environment by itself by deploying your own stuff, um, which is possible, but you need the the privileges for that. That's just one difference because usually when you're on a Linux system, you have you have like this reverse shell, your backdoor. And then you're on that for a longer time, you know. Um, that's that's one difference towards Kubernetes. Um, but what's actually new, you know? So uh, the thing is, um, by default, um, Kubernetes um, is mounting a, a, a so-called service user account token into the pod. And this token is a bearer token, JWT. Um, which uh, is uh, authenticating you against the Kubernetes API. Um, and your privileges, I mean, they vary, you know, they come, they can be, they can be nothing or just like some read writes in your namespace, or they can be, uh, you know, a misconfiguration and your class admin. 
So that is the, the, the new attack surface, which is being added um, when, you're, when you compromised a container managed by Kubernetes. You now have a token um, which authenticates you towards the Kubernetes management API. You can ask yourself, why is that the case? Uh, it's the case because by design, Kubernetes is built. So even inside of running uh, pods and application, you can still get new information, new, new, what, new whatever from the, from, from, from the Kube API server using this token. This, that's not, a, this, uh, not necessarily the case. You don't have to use it all the time. You can configure your cluster not to mount it at all, um, but it's default behavior. So to be honest, um, most classes I've seen, it was it was turned on by default. It's just to keep in mind, it's an easy um, an easy attack surface reduction tool just to turn it off if you don't if you, if you don't don't need it. Yeah, but just like don't turn it off, you know, too too easily because you probably don't really know what's being used for. It could be the case that you know your applications, your deployments do have to talk to the to, 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 towards the API during the runtime. So that is that. Um, these these tokens um, they give you you know some sort of privileges um, towards the API as I was saying before. Um, for example, I, I listed a few here, which you know could be could be evil. You know, for, for example, getting listing or updating secrets. Kubernetes is bringing a bringing in a secret store by default, um, which is being used for just like imagine you're deploying an application and it has to have database credentials. And what you don't do usually, you don't put it in your in your GitLab repository, but you're you're, you're putting in the secrets at, 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 at deployment time. And that's what a secret store is for. Um, or just like in, in any rule, like a, a wildcard rule on on any resources, like create, update, patch, list, watch, get, and delete, <clears throat> and so on. And the point is, as an attacker, you have to find out, first of all, how high are your privileges right now while uh, while you compromise a pod? And second of all, is there maybe a chance to to access another container, a pod, or deployment, or whatever, in which context, in which namespace we are having, you know, a, a bit more a higher higher privileges, just like you're doing it when you are um, when you're having a pen test in a Windows Active Directory environment. When you're in there, you're, you're a normal user. What you want to do, you want to become domain admin. And then you're you know, having the paths from normal, normal users towards domain admins. Let me just have a look at chat for a sec. Um, is there any good reason why injecting a service user is default? Uh, shouldn't your average container be agnostic to where it is ex executed and does not even know it is within a Kubernetes cluster? As I was saying before, there are use cases um, for for your pod to talk to the to the API for various things which admins want to have, uh, you know, being deployed or being communicated into your running container at runtime. That's I guess the main reason. Um, and I was asking this this question to a good number of uh, sysadmins or DevOps as called these days. Um, <clears throat> most people <laughs> couldn't really answer me the question. It was in there and. They were saying, but we can't deactivate it. And because you know somebody needs it. In the end, I, to be honest, I don't really know the actual use case. Yeah. Okay, let's just go on. Um, the nice thing is, you know, from the attacker perspective, uh, when you have this token, um, they're, <clears throat> they're nice onboard tools to check your own privileges. Yeah. Just like in, in um, an Active Directory as well. Uh, the kubectl tool, which you see here, that's the main command line tool for managing um, the cluster. Um, what it's doing, it, it, it isn't like, a, a, it's a simple tool, which is talking uh, REST HTTP calls towards the kube API server. Um, if you feel like, you can also use curl uh, to talk to the API. It's the same way. Um, the, the, the API is well defined. That's, you know, it doesn't really matter. Or there's a nice uh, command line tool <coughs> called Rakes. Uh, what, what it's doing, it's taking your token and it's more or less performing the same requests as, as of can I, 
but it's presenting you in, 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 a, in a nice matrix way. So if you have a token or a certificate, which is authenticated new towards um, the API, you can use Rekas or kubectl. OK. <clears throat> Just just let me have it uh, sip for a sec. Okay, there we go. Um, the next pretty heavy text surface is privileged pods. So what they are doing is their um, privileged pod is sharing the namespace with the host. Um, usually these kind of containers, um, they are used for network manipulation, uh, device access, or setup of the of the worker by itself. There are management um, containers. They are usually running in the kube system, the, the the system namespace of Kubernetes, and it's like for, for example, um, managing configurations of the worker, or um, supervising the running nodes. But you are free to deploy those if you feel like, or maybe if you you need them. Usually you don't need them, but you know <laughs> sometimes you do. Um, the thing is, you don't want to have any normal user, or especially an attacker, access to one of those. If if that happens, it is like having a direct, direct shell access on the underlying host as root, but not as root in a different namespace. You can have, you can be root uh, in a in a namespace which is not namespace one, which is the namespace of root root on on a node. Um, but when it's privileged, you can access uh, the main. Uh, namespace on the on a, on, on a worker which is the number one which is root. Um, if that if that happens, um, all containers can be accessed. Yeah, um, all containers can be accessed, but um, the entire Kubernetes environment is designed in that way. If you compromise one worker, it doesn't mean that you compromise the entire cluster. Um, then you can like then, then you point the running pods and containers and data on that worker, but it doesn't give you um, necessarily higher privileges towards the Kube API server. That's that has been uh, thought into the architecture of Kubernetes. Um, yeah, <clears throat> these, these privileges um, you can you can define them in your container pod uh, definition. Um, the first one is host PID. Using that you can access the PID namespace or IPC. That's the inter-process communication namespace, and so on and so on. Exactly. All right. Uh, let's just try it. Yeah. Let's let's just hope it works. Okay. Um, first question: Can you all see that here? It's my shell, or is it still in uh, in in my PowerPoint slides? It's still in the PowerPoint. Okay, I thought so. Just give, just give me a sec. So I'm just stop the share and use my different this one here. I think now you can see my shell, don't you? Yes. All right. So, what we're doing right now, we are simulating. Uh, maybe a... you can maybe you can um, zoom in a little. Let me just see Is how that possible. Works. Just give me a sec. Uh huh. Mm, I think it's plus. Anybody know by by uh, by head which are the shortage uh, the the short line in putty for zooming in while being locked in? Otherwise, I can just change the settings. Anybody know that? You can unmute yourself also and <laughs> join our, our our talk. Or is is there a Zoom feature in in Zoom? I don't think so actually. And give me a second. I can. I think I can uh, change the the size of. Uh, you could maybe push. share only the putty window and make it smaller than your full screen. Then it will be zoomed on our end. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, it should be. It. Together we can solve everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just give me a sec. There we go. Now let's share it again. How's that? Yeah, Better? seems all right to me. What do you say, Thanks. guys? Yeah, absolutely, super it's fine. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, let's. So my plan right now is to simulate 
um, having a having a shell on an underprivileged container. And then let's just, let me just see what happens. Okay, so all right now we're on some some weird shell. Not, nothing. Okay, I see I'm I'm, I'm root, but I'm root into a, some weird namespace that doesn't give me give me any any access towards the real namespace. Only just some some copy on write namespace. You know, uh, as you can see, PSRs, nothing really works. Um, it's just it's just how it is. But now we do know that by default, um, the uh, um, there's the, the the token in the namespace uh, is is mounted into the pod. So let's just see if we can see that. I mean, it's not a secret. It is mounted on a where run secrets Kubernetes. io oh what what's that it's, it's called service account yeah well, it's just it's a directory so let's just see what's in here it's uh oh, maybe that something went wrong as always Oh, oh, it's, that's a namespace. Namespace is called lowproof. But okay, it's pretty obvious what it is, but <laughs> it's our lowproof namespace. So uh, in the same folder, there's something in there. Um, oh, what is that? That is uh, a bearer token, JWT. Yeah. So this thing is, is being mounted in the container. And yeah, it is. It is there now. We have some sort of uh, authentication and authorization towards the Cube API server. Uh, what 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 also is there? Um, usually, if your container wouldn't be that hardened like mine right now, you can simply enter env on your command line, and then you can usually get all environment variables. We can't right now, but that doesn't mean that they're still there. What we're doing here is this. Ah, what's that? Yeah. This here is a cluster virtual IP address um, over which we can um, access the Cube API. Yeah, um, you know this 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 container is a, is hardened a bit too well. You know, it's, it all is it's not available. But what we do know, we have the token, this one here, um, and we we can access the, the API. So let's just see what we can do on, let's go back to our main command line. Let's just save the token towards um, towards our own environment variable. Um, and let's see what we can access um, <clears throat> having this token as an authentication node. Just, just give me a sec, in the wrong folder. There we go. Oh, oh, what's that? So what we're doing here is we are using dollar token, which is, as you probably have seen, our, our, our authentication token. Uh, it's being used as an authentication thingy for our kubectl, our command line tool, and we're getting namespaces. And right now, since we're having a config file in which usually the, the API server is written down in, and this is the, the certificate of the server is written down, uh, we're just, you know, hard coding it. This is access from outside of the um, glass down network space. That's why the, the IP address is different from the one above, you know, up here was, where was it? Mm -hmm. Somewhere else, yeah. here. And now we're using this IP. Um, yeah, and this, the, the, the file ca.cert, it contains um, a certificate for having a more or less uh, trustworthy communication. If that wouldn't be available, just uh, tell kubectl to ignore all the different errors and you just, you're fine. Um, just have a quick look at questions, for example. Uh, if you're running a service web server like Apache within a container, does the classical recommendation of not running it with a root account still apply? Yes. It still applies. Um, even though you're running it as, as root in a different namespace, being root um, still gives you some more privileges here and there um, towards some kernel APIs and some, some other 
uh, authentication mechanisms uh, in your operating system. It's really not that much big of a deal anymore compared to running it as, as root on a classical system. But if you can, and usually it's possible, and you're uh, like running Apache, um, then um, I would still say don't run it as root. Um, uh, Manuel, no, it's not usually. Um, what, what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm cheating a bit. Um, if it would, would have been stayed on on my on my pretty heavily hardened um, container, I would have to upload curl or w uh, get for example some some HTTP command line tool to talk with it. Um, I skip that right now to like keep it simple or or upload kubectl, which is possible as well. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are some misconfigurations where your kubectl API is really reachable in the, on the internet, but <clears throat> okay, yeah, let's not talk about that too much. <laughs> so where we've been, yeah, now we got a token. Um, we got our we, we've listed the namespaces. Um, let's just uh, check out uh, what what our privileges are towards um, towards the. Uh, the API. There we go. Okay. Um, that is the kubectl command line tool, um, which is giving you uh, a not too well overview about what you can do. I'm saying request makes the job easier, but you can see. Um, even, let's just zoom out a little bit so it looks nicer. Yeah, it's a bit better. Up here, uh, wait, wait a sec, it's even better. We see secrets, and uh, we have a get watch list primitive verb onto, onto this API. But that means um, we are having get watch list privileges on the, the secret store of Kubernetes, which uh, isn't too good, you know? <laughs> let's just see what happens then. Um, let's just just list secret. Oh, no, something went, went wrong. Oh, oh, oh we're we having here. We're uh, getting secrets. Um, that that, that was ourself. Uh, low proof, as you, as you see. Um, but if if we can we can try to access secrets from a different namespace. Uh, minus n uh, lists um, is, is a parameter for for specifying the uh, the namespace. Let's just have a, a look at the namespace again. It's, the, it's a bit it's a bit constructed the example, but there's a namespace called hypriv overload. Oh okay well what's that? Yeah. Uh, let's just try to list secrets in that namespace. Mm -hmm. Something went wrong again. It's Windows. Oh, there is a token in here, uh, which is in the namespace hyperf overload. Um, what we can do right now is describe it. If kubectl describe, that really gives you the content of this uh, of this uh, entry. You can you can output it in JSON or in, in YAML. It's, it's up to you. By default, it's uh, some text definition. And right here, that's that's another, that's a different token. Yeah. So what we're doing right now is we're using this token. Um, just give me a sec. Let's see here. Now we got token admin uh, in our environment variable, and now let's see what we can do right now. Now we are using this token to access the API. Again, which is uh, command off and can I? Enter, oh, yeah. what's here? Okay, that is that is devastating. Now we got a, a wildcard on resources, which means, which means every resource on the on the on the API and the verb also wildcard. I mean, that's, it's, it's a bit constructed, but it shows you the idea, yeah? Um, just like to, to finish that here, what we can do right now, we can uh, like run a privileged container, which is giving us um, root on the underlying host. Um, it's, it's, it's copied, but uh, that's wrong. Um, just like to, to, to show you what we're doing. Um, 
in this command is in, in the beginning, we are using the, 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 the command spec, which is specifying the, uh, the parameters of our container. And we're saying host PID is true, which allows us to access uh, uh, the, the, the PID names, namespace of, a, uh, of, of, the, of, of root. Using some image doesn't really matter. Important is the, the first command when we get into the, the container is we're using NS enter, which means namespace enter. And then we're using a mount pouch, which is proc one NSMNT. That's the mount point of the root file system. And then access is with, with, with bash. Um, and as a setting, we are giving over privileged is true. Because a container in um, uh, a user in the namespace hyperif overload in this case is allowed to run a, a privileged container. So if we're doing that, just enter it for a sec. Yeah. We are still root, that's stupid case. But yeah, so they are now they're running all kinds of containers on the underlying host, as you can see. And if you're doing OS on, on the main file system, it, that's that's the real file system. And so on. Let's just not get going into too much detail because it's my my work in VM. <laughs> yeah, that was the main idea of um, you know, having a a token on a low privilege container, having some more privileges uh, with this. Um, with this um, token towards the, the, the API server, then we are reading out a different secret and using that to access uh, the container in a more privileged way and then running a root container. A bit constructed, but it makes you give, give the idea. Uh, there's there's some, some question. If you once again for fixing, commenting, oh, um, yeah, I can share this command. I can put it, I think it's, I think it's in the slide. It, does, it doesn't really, uh, it isn't really a, a an, an unknown feature is just, you know, you're deploying a, a privileged container and then you're using the command line tool, Linux, uh, NS enter. If you're on your Ubuntu VM, uh, it's, it's available as well. But yeah, I, I can share it. A diagram of my setup, uh, it's pretty simple. I'm using Minikube right now. Uh, Minikube is really, just Google it. It's five to 10 minutes and you got your own cluster running. No worries. Uh, it's, it's, it's really built so you can easily trying to reproduce um, a more complex setup. It has some some shortcuts here and there, but for most use cases, um, it's it's doing the job. Mini cube, this one here. Oh, <laughs> you meant role bindings for having um, for having um, bad uh, access to what secrets? Yeah, I got it. Um, I can put it in chat later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can, I can, I can post the bindings here, but you just don't use them in production. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's just like switch back towards the slides. Got to stop it again and share this. There we go. Uh, is it, can you see it already? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Okay. I mean, that was the, the main point just in the end. What I'm putting in here is a, a few commands, which is which show a bit bit more typical attacker behavior uh, when you got a shell on the pod. I mean, just right now was constructed, you know. But what you're doing usually is showing all images, getting the network policy, um, seeing all cluster admins, um, seeing which cluster roles and roles um, having access to secrets. So then next step, you can you have to check out which cluster role bindings these are bound to or role bindings. Um, conflict maps, because in conflict maps, it, they're containing um, sensitive data quite often. Um, cluster role, role wildcard access to some resource, you know, let's, let's just see where, where's a wildcard in use. A uh, listing of all persistent volumes. Persistent volumes are used to store something on a file system. It's, it's an abstract uh, Kubernetes springs into the game, which gives you the option to abstract NFS shares, uh, local local shares on the same worker also possible. Uh, S S three API is, is also an option. But yeah, there might be some interesting stuff on on them if you're having read access to us. Um, then for privilege asks, uh, listing all privilege pods, um, listing all pods which allow privilege escalation also feature, or root pods, sys admin caps, and so on. There's there's a good number of not, not never ending, but a longer list of 
more or less dangerous privileges which are available. The two rec cube is trying to sum up some of them in the slides more in the back on, on my slide set. I wrote also a smaller list which is trying to contain a few of them. Chat. Does it make sense to monitor alert for the issuance of some or all of these commands? Or is there too much noise, too many false positives? I wouldn't monitor for these kubectl uh, commands, if you mean that. Uh, you're talking about um, <clears throat> attacker movement on a possibly, hmm, I think that's, that's hard to do because I mean, these kubectl commands, um, what they're doing, they're just firing out um, uh, REST API calls which could easily be legit. I mean, I haven't seen any any approach towards uh, towards monitoring the REST API, which, which, which is the next question, good, good point. You can monitor the REST API directly, but let's keep in mind that there are legit use cases for privileged containers. You can monitor them. I mean, if you're having a CM or something or a, a cert that they're like saying, okay, there some, some new privileged container has been deployed. Was that legit? You could try doing that. Um, looks like some work when you're having a heavy load on your on your cluster, and also a good number of legitimate privileged containers. Um, but it's an option. I mean, on the other hand, there are security tools um, which try to help you monitor uh, a container at runtime. That's another option um, to see hmm, uh, why is why is netcat being called. Uh, why is somebody trying to port scan? Why, is, why, why are files being uploaded? That's possible. Um, there are tools for that. Um, I think one, I think the most famous one, commercial one is TwistLock. Um, and a newer, newer play, player on the, in, in this game is, is Neuvektor. Uh, they were just, uh, just acquired by, by SUSE most recently. They're trying that. But monitoring of the API, haven't seen it yet. Which doesn't mean it, it's it's not possible. Could be the case still. Okay, let's go on. Um, so yeah, there's one really really important security feature um, which is trying to hinder you to deploy privileged pods. Um, and you, the point is, I think they are not turned on by default. Um, I think even they're being deprecated right now towards a new feature which is trying to hinder the deployment of privileged containers. Um, right now, still, it's, it's pod security policies. Um, they, are, they are putting constraints on newly created pods, which have to be fulfilled uh, before being allowed to be deployed. So if you, as an underprivileged user, which is not classed admin, trying to deploy a privileged container, and it's being rejected, then, sorry, then, then it's being rejected by the pod security policy. Yeah. Um, so. In, in this case, only members of the most high privileged uh, namespace uh, are allowed to de deploy high privileged containers. Um, members of a namespace, which is also a pretty interesting thing to, to, to mention right now, because there is no real, there's no user management in Kubernetes. Um, you might ask yourself why, uh, how is it being handled then? They're just namespaces and representation of users in this namespace, for example, using service account tokens or certificates signed by the Cube API server. Uh, in a certificate, um, your, your binding, so your, the name of your user, um, is, is, I think it's written in the CN field, in the certificate. And then on request, it's being mapped um, with rules and rule bindings towards a namespace. That's all, which also brings up the question, uh, what's up with uh, certificates which you, you want to uh, you know, which shouldn't be valid anymore. I, I don't think there's any certificate revocation in Kubernetes right now. I'm not quite sure. And service account tokens, I mean, they can, they can be easily deleted, but there, there are no real users in Kubernetes. Yeah, this is a host security policy, which, um, which uh, makes you deploy your container underprivileged. Yeah, just, just to put it in here. Uh, you can also drop all kinds of kernel privileges using pod security policies. Also interesting, I think, I think these here are even recommended by Kubernetes itself. Then uh, another really important topic <clears throat> is network policies. 
if you don't deploy that in the policy, your pods are allowed to send re receive traffic without uh, any limitation. Um, so if you are using an network policy, um, yeah, in, in case of breach, it can reduce the impact um, of your breach uh, and makes ledger movement as hard as possible for an attacker. Um, usually it's being built upon some sort of, they call it container network interface. There are a good number of plugins for, uh, which, are, which, can, which can be used. Um, if they are in use, what you can do is deploying uh, networking rules for your pods. So you can really map uh, ingoing and outgoing uh, communications, um, just like with IP tables, but on a different on a different layer. In the end, they are being being represented as as rules, but I just not go too much into, into detail. Um, yeah, if if everything is configured properly, um, they can be be used pretty easily. And just like I really have to stick it out here because you have to use it. Um, I, I think up until today, I have ordered a good number of add-ons for Kubernetes. And um, quite often <clears throat> they're bringing in their own, um, you know, management network services in their pods. And quite often they just forget the authentication for their gRPC service or for the REST service. So um, I've seen a good, good number of add-ons for Kubernetes, which are allowing a code execution by design. And when you're having network policies in place, at least an attacker can't access these add-ons network services. Uh, oh, there's there are a good number of questions up there and just check it out. Yeah, stop. So can PSP also contain rules like ensuring a vulnerability scan of the container image was performed <clears throat> or container contains no high vulnerabilities? I don't think so. I think what, you, what you're trying to do is usually being done by by a pipeline, by a CI/CD pipeline, um, which which then would you know perform the scan of the of your image um, before the actual deployment. There are um, plugins or add-ons for Kubernetes which are scanning the container images which are available in your registry. That's that's a possibility, yeah, but it doesn't hinder you on deploying those, yeah. Next question. Uh, do unprivileged containers per default have the permission to launch other unprivileged containers? No, they don't. No, um, the, the container itself doesn't have any permissions. I mean, the service user can have permission to, to launch, to start a new pod, but the default rule uh, of a service account user usually um, doesn't give you the access, to, uh, the, 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 priv the privilege to start a new pod. I mean, that would be not too bad because then you could like try to to perform denial of, denial, denial of service scenarios, I guess. Okay, note by Marcus. By default, network policies are not effective despite being defined unless the CNI actually supports it. That's true. <clears throat> Can you share a link to your slides? I do in the end, Matthias. Uh, Roman is, is asking, is there any policy on pod or container level by which you may restrict specific token use or either starting or accepting a session? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I think you can define which kind of token is being mounted in the, in, into the container. I don't know if it's being used in uh, the pod skill policy. What's, what can be used in the pod skill policy is uh, you, can, you can deny the mounting of service account tokens by, by themselves generally. That's possible. The pod, secu pod security policy, which token token is being mounted in itself? I think it has to be explicitly defined uh, in your pod, and therefore also defined. Uh, it's also like bound towards the user you are using to deploying this pod. You know, if you're not a cluster admin, um, you can't mount you know a secret by a high privileged container. Uh, sorry, high privileged user. That wouldn't be possible. If that's if, if, if that was if that was your guest question, I'm not 100 sure. <clears throat> Just give me a sec. Yeah, Roman, just let me know if there was a question. Um, otherwise, I would just uh, keep going right now. Yeah, I mean, there are alternatives or more or less more add-ons towards network policies. Um, there are service message, uh, meshes like IO. Um, 
when they are in use, they usually um, uh, this this allowing every every level of communication, and then you really have to list what are my communication um, relations to other parts or to other services outside of your cluster. What they're doing usually, they're <clears throat> they're mounting up another part. They're calling it a sidecar. The side sidecar is actually just a proxy, um, and they are having TLS certifications in there, and they are authenticating you towards another sidecar, and then the the entire traffic between those two pods is being tunneled over those uh, two sidecars and they are mutually authenticated, which is a nice thing, I would say. Thanks. Okay, all right, Roman. So, uh, main takeaways for now. <laughs> I think it's a, it, it's a lot, but um, still, use a PSP that enforces the lowest privilege as possible in pods. Um, on using that way, you can force most users to um, de deploy low privileged pods, which are not uh, privileged in any way, and having um, even a lower attack surface towards the kernel. Yeah. Um, the, re the resources being put out by Kubernetes itself, they are pretty nice. They give you an option and to, to, like re to like read a bit into that and get a nice overview. Um, second of all, uh, use least privileges for your roles and cluster roles all over the place. Um, that means, you know, when you're having different different departments in your company which are deploying uh, stuff by themselves, give them different namespaces and different users and different service accounts or certificates. Um, and also, if possible, just don't mount these service account tokens into your container if you don't really need them. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're playing evil, you can just like turn it off and let's see, let, let's see let's see what happens in your cluster, but yeah, I mean I, I would just talk to people to 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 DevOps and see if that's a if if that's a feasible thing. Um, yeah, and then also like try to avoid mounting volumes from the underlying host if not absolutely absolutely necessary. There are other options like S3 volumes or um, dev block storage solutions like Longhorn by SUSE. Um, to store data, um, yeah, there are, there are a few options, um, but just don't mount them if you don't actually actually need, need them. Otherwise, you can mount them. No worries. Uh, and then in the end, um, yeah, make use of network policies if possible. It should be possible, to be honest. Yeah, it just gives you a way better uh, way to to filter uh, where your containers can talk to. <clears throat> uh, it, it might be other containers or it might be your internal network. Just just try to try to try, try to use that. That's really important. Yeah, that's it for now. Um, just in the end, um, we are hiring Pentest and, and devs. Um, then I was saying uh, I'm gonna upload these slides. In the end, here there's there are way, 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 way more slides and settings, which you can have a look into. Um, yeah, and a lot, lot of tools uh, and links and so on. Just if you uh, if you feel like you're needing some more information, I'm trying to put it all in the end of the slides. It wouldn't make any sense to talk about everything during the talk here, but yeah, they are, they are here. Um, security, security tooling in general is getting way better um, than let's say two or three years ago in Kubernetes. Um, then just, uh, yeah. So far so good. I think there are more questions. <clears throat> Okay, Philip is asking, do you usually allow developers to change the network config of their pods? Hmm, because they could, for example, maybe inadvertently make their pod accessible from the internet. Hmm, as far as I know, usually uh, they can define the, um, the services accessible from their own pods by themselves. That's a good question, to be honest. Um, hmm. Hmm. I mean, there are probably more rules which can be uh, uh, applied by um, by DevOps. Uh, just uh, the pod accessible from internet is usually not the case. Usually, for making a pod accessible from the internet, there's another component which is sitting in front uh, of all services which are going to be exposed by by Kubernetes, uh, which is which they call proxy usually. Weirdly, yeah. <laughs> and usually you are defining is really uh, explicitly which kind of of your of your community services are being exposed over this proxy. So probably 
in devs can probably misconfigure their uh, their containers so more services will be available by other pods or by the internal network internet i mean it differs from the setup i mean there might there might be uh there might be classes where the devs can expose them to the internet directly. Um, but if you're asking if there might be some sort of pod security policies for networking, I don't think so, as far as I know. As far as I know. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more questions right now? Otherwise, um, yeah. You can maybe, write them in here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Johannes, maybe you can just um, also share your your mail and also link to your uh, slides in chat, and I will copy paste them directly into the comments of the meetup session, so that everybody in the meetup can check them. Also, we will uh, provide the the video to this talk, mm -hmm. and um, I will firstly uh, send it to you, Johannes, so you can take a look at it if you feel that it's appropriate enough. Mm -hmm. And I'll also stop the recording. Uh, I would maybe have a short last question. Uh, it's oh. Philip again, sorry. Uh, 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 do, do you like have any experience uh, regarding having like dedicated Kubernetes environments for like uh, containers of different security level or importance or like using dedicated nodes? Yeah, um, I, I, have, I have one customer that's doing that. Um, they're using, they're using multi-cluster management solutions like Rancher, for example, uh, if you have heard of that. That is it's actually another Kubernetes cluster managing okay. more Kubernetes clusters. They are also adding one more layer of authentication on top of it. And then they are, they are, they are, seg they are segregating containers by um, data uh, protection levels. Mm -hmm. uh, that's I think, I think it was defined in German German law. Okay, I mean, these, these pods are handling uh, data which are classified as this and this and this level and so on. That's possible, yeah. Okay. And I've I've seen people doing that. Yeah. It, also mainly if they are obligated to do that under under law. Mm. Mm. Pretty uncommon, you would say. Pretty pretty uncommon. Pretty okay. uncommon. I mean, if you're deploying a, a managed Kubernetes in AWS, it would be pretty uncommon to do it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's possible. Yeah, thanks mm -hmm. a lot. You're welcome. Again, perfect. So Johannes, thank you very much for your talk. Also, thank everybody for joining. Uh, again, if you have further questions concerning Kubernetes security, for example, or penetration tests or something on uh, Condignum, as well as SPA are happy to provide. Um, also, Johannes is looking for uh, developers as uh, in Condignum. So if you're interested, take a look at their website. Uh, I think the talk was very cool. Also, thank you for your demo. It was really uh, nice to see. Uh, <laughs> <shoo>. <laughs> it worked um, anyways um, thank you guys also for joining again thanks Johannes um, 